Steve Keeney, friends. Today's special guest, co-author of Rebels at Work and former CIA employee, Carmen Medina. This should be a, a, an easy episode um, for you. Four times evaluation of the output at the same time. And that applies fairly consistently regardless of which country you look at. Different countries have two ratios. The average tends to be about three. But if you look at the capital stock and divide it by three, uh, in most countries exactly what the output but the expression that ties put together there like that <laughs> okay the dog is gone okay um, I'm, 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 I'm gonna mute so myself. what we have first of all is saying you better with the dog barking like that in the background you better okay so this, and i can call this backslash i'll uh, just drop my mouse and my batteries have dropped out i'm sure so i'm going to be in great trouble putting it back together again hang on we are doing very. We are doing very well in today's show. Are we? <laughs> I just dropped the battery on the floor. Mate. Bloody hell! I, I'm like my keyboard. Damn it! My keyboard. The bloody thing has a. a I'm, I'm on my floor, looking for the parts of my mouse that have fallen on the fucking. Oh dear! So I'm going to find a battery on the floor. Damn! Hang on. Oh, I'm not going to live that wow. down, am I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I uh, I want to welcome everybody to uh, uh, another episode of, of Stephen Friends. I'm, I'm really excited about tonight's, uh, today's episode. Uh, we've got Carmen Medina. And uh, of course, we've got Steve Keen. So I think we're all friends here. Uh, but the introduction between uh, Carmen and Steve is is happening live, and I, I couldn't be happier to bring that up. You mm -hmm. know, on the um, on the introduction, uh, I, I I I really enjoyed that, Steve. And I think that was the <laughs> first time that you saw it. Uh, I have to give uh, a shout out to the producer uh, of of that, and that's that's Tyrone. That's the uh, yeah, the, Tyrone Keynes. He Ty, did a wonderful. He's having job. he's having too much fun here. <laughs> this is getting <laughs> seriously you know, getting too much fun, which is great. Yeah, yeah like I I could see Steve in the in the in the the thumbnail to the left uh, backstage, and the reactions and laughing. It was great, but. Um, Carmen, just to give you a heads up, you probably pieced together uh, in in kind of a bit of a gestalt fashion that there was um, it, some screw ups or some highlight reel of some some madness going on. And actually, that's exactly what happened last week. You know, if something could go wrong, it went wrong. And it did. Uh, first of all, yeah, Ty was trying to show his screen while I was talking, and then he couldn't get his. I don't know what was going on with his with his um, screen, but he couldn't get his model to work properly or turn up on the right screen. So I took over in the middle of it, my mouse, which I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a rather like it. It's a Microsoft mouse. But the, what the hassle with it is, it was right near my desk. It fell off the edge because my microphone cable was getting in the way. The cover comes off and the batteries dropped out. I and hate when I that happens. It. <laughs> it was amusing, give it that much. I managed to finish the model anyway. I finally, I finally found the, mis plug yeah, in I found the missing button. No, we're good. Yeah. I found the missing battery and we finally got it finished, but it was a bit, bit chaotic. So 
let's have over to you. I mean, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to meet you and reading your profile as well. So what's a nonconformist do inside the CIA? Oh, well, a nonconformist, uh, like a nonconformist in any organization, mm. uh, is trying to advance uh, new ideas that uh, at worst are neutral ideas probably, but mm. the, obviously they're being advanced because we think they're better ideas. Trying mm -hmm. to advance uh, these ideas in an organization that's allergic to them. Yeah. Sometimes immune, you know, mm. just, just cannot accept them. And uh, when we talk about rebels at work, uh, there there's several distinctions to be made here. Uh, you're not a rebel at work because you think you're the smartest person in the room. That's actually a poor prescription for a rebel at work. That, that'd make Larry Summers a rebel, which doesn't really doesn't really compute. <laughs> and uh, so you're a rebel at work because you've proposed, and this will happen to everyone, I think, in their career. They'll propose a new idea to an organization which they think is a good idea, and they realize the organization hates it. Instantly. If after that yeah. initial reaction, you persevere and you continue... Mm -hmm trying to make the organization move in a better direction, that's when you become a rebel at work. And yeah. it's a very difficult place for most people. Uh, when we wrote the book, uh, Lois Kelly and I, in uh, almost 10 years ago, it was published in 2014. We wrote it in 2013. There weren't a lot of people who were talking about how do you help people in a, in a job advance new ideas? It just wasn't... Mm common topic. Most business books are written for managers. There are mm. precious few business books written for the average employee. Mm. And people said, you're crazy. Nobody's going to want to read a book about being a rebel at work. And here we are almost 10 years later, and there's several books now have come out along this idea mm. of a rebel leader, nonconformist. And, um, I think it's, and certainly with the the way work is changing now, mm -hmm. uh, it's become, I don't think it's quite a mainstream idea, but there's a lot of more people thinking about it and trying to figure out how to make change happen in very stodgy organizations. Mm -hmm. Without getting sacked in the process. But that's it. With, and, and, and where the psychological and emotional conflict occurs is that a lot of the people who have these ideas are really good employees. And so they're used mm -hmm. to advancing quickly and being accepted and, you know, uh, making a difference. And all of a sudden they have this idea where uh, that's, that's, you know, uh, non-orthodox counter to the prevailing orthodoxy of the organization. This, this happens a lot. And now they're being punished for trying to bring their best self to work, so. Well, Steve, I mean, I think Steve may be a little frozen there. Well, he's he's probably in awe because you're describing <laughs> certain buzzwords from Steve that he's, mm -hmm. um, I guess, had to there just at a out of no choice of his own, he's had to embody. I mean. Uh, it, you know, he's, he's been up against the machine, so to speak. So, um, Steve, are you, uh, are, are you there? Do you have a, or is the signal dropped? I had a, something, we said we'd be going back again. I'm, I can see that I'm moving. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's been my entire career, frankly. Uh, I've been an iconoclast in every organization I've been in and, um, I get used to being the person saying the uncomfortable things. Um, and the question is, how do you get the organization itself to embrace those unconventional things? So, Carmen, what was what was your initial unconventional thought that made oh, you a... My, mine, was a mine was a huge one. Mine was yeah. in the uh, 1990s, uh, I, with the dawn of the internet and the digital age, 
I became convinced that the internet was going to change everything for knowledge organizations. I was a hundred percent on it. And, um, I started saying at the CIA that we need to start make because we were very much like a classified newspaper uh, in in the way we supported policymakers. And I said, we're going to have to do things quite differently in the future. And we're going to start having to make adjustments. And so if you recall, let's say 1995, the internet was all about transparency and open information and kumbaya and the CIA, what's the CIA about? None of that. Even mm. at its best moments, it's it's not about that. And it's it, it's sort of prevailing orthodoxy was uh, the world is full of enemies. They're keeping things from us. We have to keep secret what we know. Most people can't be trusted to handle classified information. And the digital revolution is made by the devil. Um, and uh, there, that's uh, that was the the first and and in many ways, all my subsequent ideas uh, were indents under that big idea uh, that mm. we have to somehow adjust to the to the digital revolution. And and I will just say, uh, well, I have the floor, so to speak, that most organizations. Many businesses have failed to adjust to the world that's being created by the digital revolution, and uh, and they and they bear part of the blame for the uh, issues like such as disinformation or uh, con you know conspiracy theories because outside of large organizations, information is flowing very quickly in unfiltered, un, non-hierarchical ways. And yet, particularly the government insists on trying to communicate with the, the citizens in very old fashioned ways that just don't keep up with what's going on. So um, that's that's definitely something that I've, I've been on an advocate of for some time. So let, let me ask uh, Carmen, um, what would you suggest they they do as an organization? I mean, I'm not I, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be uh, uh, a big leap to having an organization like the CIA jump onto Twitter and embrace a. a but they a, have. A, they have. They have. They eh? have. Interesting. And, and, and uh, it now. You know, I retired 12 years ago, so there you have it. It's been. Uh, uh, a long time, uh, but how how would you do it? Uh, or what do I think organizations should do? Well, I, I think they need to modernize their communication strategy. So uh, one of it is to is to learn to be on to to be on the platforms and learn to interact on the platforms in a way that makes sense. So. Uh, the CIA has wandered onto Twitter, and and they're they're sort of uh, uh, have had their interesting moments on Twitter, uh, but a lot of other uh, statements by large organizations on uh, social media or ways of communicating on platforms have been sort of to just cut and paste what they would have done with a PR spokesman and and put it on the platform, and that just doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't have the informality. It doesn't have the immediacy. It doesn't have the genuineness that people in social media platforms are expecting. So, um, I, you know, that's an example, I think, of the kind of things they, they should do. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a specific example when the uh, blue check mark issue occurred on Twitter and people started imitating large companies. Somebody apparently imitated Chiquita Banana or the whatever the parent company is of Chiquita Banana and accused it. I, I never saw the tweet accused it of launching a coup and the Chiquita Banana Twitter person came on and said, we're Chiquita Banana and we just want you to know that we have not overthrown a government since 1954. Now, that was kind of funny, <laughs> right? That was funny. It was that, that's, clever. That's 
that's referring to Cuba. Yeah, it, it was not yeah. officious, right? And and <laughs> you know, I, I think you know, if I if I were to put it into a soundbite, I think that large organizations were used to being officious, and yeah. now they have to learn to be informal but still mm -hmm. authoritative or yeah. um, authoritative, maybe not the quite the right word, but they, they have to figure that out. And that, that's I think actually, that's, yeah. that's where, that's, that's, actually, that's, that's where the failure has occurred. I believe. Yeah. I've, is, like a, the similar uh, experience I've had with a much less significant organization, the Australian electoral commission and like Australia's elections are far better managed than the American ones. Bureaucrats, on the basis of laws, decide what the uh, distribution of seats uh, is. So you don't have politicians gerrymandering the electorates to make sure they get re-elected. Um, the, the votes are counted by the bureaucracy uh, and they're very, very formal. And you'd imagine, therefore, a very, very officious organisation. But they engaged with Twitter just this last election in Australia and they were hilarious. And they got across their objectives of the organisation extremely well as well. Uh, but they would be quite lighthearted in how they'd interact with people. Right. And that's right. A, a big change of how bureaucracies normally interact. Right. Uh, uh. <clears throat> well, I'll bring up a, another question here. Um, and I'm, I'm curious for my, you know, for my own sake about um, a bridging together two words and I, uh, uh, and, and their professions, right? So on one side, we've got analyst and then other side, we've got economist. And um, I'm going to I'm going to ask I'm going to give the question to Steve first and then I'm going to give it uh, ask as Carmen to, to answer. How do you think the two uh, work together? How do they work well together? And I'm and what I'm referring to is uh, an analyst and an economist and in individually and in groups. So, um, Steve, what, what do you think uh, the role of an analyst is and how would a, an economist actually work with an analyst? Well, I mean, when you've got people working as analysts in the CIA, they're fundamentally doing political uh, thinking. And by, frankly, I've got to say that I'm you know, a huge critic of America's uh, secret services, F to, to CIA in particular, but also the FBI, that uh, the sort of mindset that Carmen's talking about where they have a very set perspective. Um, I see the CIA in attempting to defend America's interests more often than not screwing those interests up by turning what could have been an ally into an enemy. And one of the little lines I've used with friends frequently is, if you want to know who America's current enemy is, check who their previous friend was. And they'll do something which, uh, you know, like in, in the, the, I mean, your, your example about Cuba is a very, very funny one. Uh, but of course, the, uh, the, the, the coup that overthrew the democratically elected government of Iran led to the installing the Shah, gave us the uh, Ayatollah, and, and the chaos there, my feeling always was keep out of it, sit back and let a theocracy run the country for 10 or 20 years and the locals will be up in arms at some point and that will bring it undone. If you try to intervene, you'll end up strengthening the theocracy rather than strengthening the protest against them. I think that pretty much happened and, and the, the big change of course this year was when, uh, when the theocracy uh, killed a young woman because she wasn't wearing a hijab uh, then there's this protest across the entire country, and you can rely on that internal dynamic. So my my thought about a you know an iconoclastic position inside the CIA would say don't intervene, sit back and let the internal dynamics work its way through. Now, how would an idea like that go down inside the CIA? Well, I mean, I, I think that it would be received with, um, you know, it would be considered. So. Um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there about the CIA, um, yep. and um, you know I, I don't have time to get into them, but certainly there would be, you know, in in country X, is the right policy to try to intervene in some way, either through diplomacy. I mean, not all interventions are. Uh, kinetic in nature, yeah. right? Uh, mm. Or is the right thing uh, to let the situation evolve naturally because it's probably going to evolve naturally in a way that will not be detrimental to U.S. interests? That would be the debate. 
Mm -hmm. And the U.S. does not have the resources, nor does any country have the resources, even if it worked, which generally it doesn't, to go around and try to fix other uh, situations in the world. I think that that's yeah, that would be one of the misconceptions that that people have. Um, so there. Mm. Of course, you would say maybe that with any organization, you'd see that um, the 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 dirty laundry is aired, right? So, uh, could you give an example of um, uh, and just some things that come to mind that that have been uh, really a benefit to uh, you know, the work that the CAA has done? Uh, could you could you maybe? Uh, respond with something that you would think that you know wasn't a scandal, right? So I mean, there's got to be a lot of, of of good work. So could you think of a couple of examples to well, I mean, to I'll, offer I'll, in I'll, I'll give you uh, several examples. So a lot of the technologies that have been developed uh, over the years for you know gathering information. Uh, have been adopted for civilian purposes as well. You know, I'd have to Google it to, to get the details, but uh, a lot of the beginnings of, of scanning methods that are used, for example, in medicine were things that were first developed for military or intelligence purposes. Similarly, a lot of information that we now understand and the ability to measure Things like uh, climate change uh, are due to the fact that, you know, since the 1960s, and in fact, earlier than that, 1950s, we were uh, taking um, uh, films, continuously images of all sorts of parts of the world. And because those images existed, now we can make definitive um, comparisons and, and sort of measure the loss of glaciers and snow caps, et cetera. Uh, from a, a direct point of view, I can point to what happened during the Ukraine war, because this is uh, common knowledge that the CIA uh, analysts and other analysts in the US government warned correctly about the likelihood of a Russian invasion into Ukraine. And that warning gave people time to uh, prepare themselves for, you know, what would happen when the invasion occurred. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that's just known to be out there. I mean, that, that, that was, that was what happened. And that is that actually intelligence, intelligence gathering, uh, rather than trying to manipulate systems and saying what is actually happening. And like, I must admit, I, I was, one of the people who was surprised by the war starting because I, my expectation was that if, um, like I un understood the perspective of the Russians that the and NATO had been trying to undermine uh, Russia when Russia was Russia, when Russia was no longer the Soviet Union. So the whole history of installing Yeltsin, um, the uh, ineffective transition from socialism to capitalism. Um, and and uh, Jeffrey Sachs and I got involved in an argument once actually, it was quite fascinating. I, I've read Sachs's work on Russia and the transition, and I was highly critical of it. He was one of the people who said in his academic papers that you should make an instant transition from capital, from socialism to capitalism. And I just thought that's impossible. You cannot do it. Um, one particular writer made a comment about maybe we should simply uh, on, on one day uh, declare all uh, prices deregulated so the market can reach equilibrium instantly. And my response was, what market? The entire structure of a market simply wasn't there. And so the idea of a rapid transition would cause a chaotic breakdown in Russia, which is precisely what happened. <clears throat> now, um, and, and what Sachs found, which is quite fascinating, he went in because he was so pro this rapid transition, that fitted in with the administration, the Reagan administration's attitudes and, the, and the, even, even Clinton in some ways. And he got inside the State Department. He said he found when he was in the State Department, people couldn't give a shit about the principle of the transition. They wanted to destroy their rival. And they saw the breakdown as being exactly what they wished to achieve. And, of course, that's a huge part of the animosity that Russians have towards Americans, and justifiably so. Um, but my feeling was that what would happen is that uh, with, this, with this Ukraine war, that uh, Putin would make an invasion in the Donbass region. 
and basically saying you can't have a NATO um, partner on the border of Russia, um, so get out, and 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 then and then you would have had negotiations to make sure Ukraine didn't join NATO. Instead, the whole the whole scale invasion took me completely by surprise, and I've given up thinking about it in terms of America versus Russia. To me, it was most a form of 19th century imperialism. And on that front, I've, from what I've seen, it does think the CIA was correct. They got it right that that was what Putin intended doing. And now we've got this quagmire which has been going on now for almost, well, nine, it must be nine months, it'll be up to a year in, what, February or March? That's right. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, um, I was going to ask you, um, Carmen, um, we've had a lot of time to, uh, I mean, we had five or six episodes together and spent uh, over an hour uh, on each of those episodes. And so we've, we've got to know each other's story quite well. Um, I remember in, in your position as an analyst, I was curious, and I, I'm, I'm hoping you can explain for the audience um, what and how you approach uh, just as as a as a leader within an organization looking at populations right so when when you were an analyst with the caa did you um like how, how would you describe your own version of intelligence gathering i mean and not just intelligence gathering but how you derive and how you draw conclusions from that i think you um if, if i'm leading the answer a little bit here um I think you actually gained a reputation for looking beyond the numbers and drawing insights that were um, valuable, uh, more so than just uh, you know from from numbers on a spreadsheet sort of thing. Can you can you elaborate a little bit about how you derive information and intelligence from from populations specifically? Well, um, I first I, I want to clear what people think of intelligence. So I, I prefer the, the phrase sense making because that's what we all are in the business of doing. Every one of us is in the business of making sense of their world. And um, there's lots of information out there, information, not necessarily secret intelligence, information that is available to everyone if they choose to look at it, that will help them make sense of the world. And I think what I in particular did more than other people did was that I paid attention to the smaller things. I paid attention to uh, non-obvious indicators of uh, change or momentum I was highly influenced by my understanding of complexity theory, which developed in the 1990s. And as a result, I understood that societies, I became convinced, and I think it's generally true, that societies often change below the surface in ways that are not immediately apparent. And that uh, when a certain amount of momentum occurs, that change will appear as a surprise, but inevitably, when there's a postmortem done on the surprise, people go back and can see uh, after the fact the indicators that they should have been able to realize in real time. And so I, my kind of whole goal is to, is to realize those indicators in real time. So I spent a lot of time and interest in uh, you know, in what the popular culture was like, what art in a particular country was like, what their movies were like, how they portrayed themselves, because that to me was an indicator of what was really going on in a society. And I think the big issue in the world, and this circles us back to where we began, big issue in the world right now, if, if I can be allowed such a gross overstatement, is whether or not it is still an elite driven world or whether it's becoming much more of a bottom up world uh, mm -hmm. what what really matters to the what does what really matters to the fate of america or to any country or to any individual 
because uh, it what is what really matters the decisions made in back rooms by you know variously corrupt individuals or ineffective governments is that what really matters or does what really matter uh, social movements phenomenon such as climate change uh, the diffusion of information uh, on the world stage now. The answer, of course, is both matter in varying degrees in varying situations. But if your focus is just on what governments and elites do, uh, you're going to miss what's going on mm -hmm. at the ground level of societies. And I, I do believe that the story of the 20th century and the early 21st century is that the bottom up has become increasingly more important. Um, and um, and and that's just a very interesting thing, and in in some ways, runs counter to the uh, governing. Well, in, in many ways, runs counter to the governing philosophies uh, of many countries. Mm. Yeah, uh, I find it amusing watching how many people are saying the elite was in control of what happened with COVID. <laughs> I think. The elite was out of control with what happened with COVID. It was the greatest disaster um, you could ever imagine, uh, though I'm sure we'll have worse ones with climate change coming our way. But the idea that I, the elite was in control, there was a joke. I had a great conversation just when COVID began with uh, someone I knew who had responsibility for issues such as COVID. And they had actually uh, done a simulation, a war game, so to speak, of a okay. pandemic breaking out. And mm. so I, I asked this person, well, what happened? And they said, well, you know, we had all these roles for all these different uh, individuals, actors in the simulation, but there was one actor we did not simulate, and it was the common citizen, the average mm. Joe Blow and Jane Doe. And I, I just thought that was so fascinating, uh, yeah. kind of classic, very sad, uh, mm -hmm. and indicative of this problem that organizations are having of making this adjustment in their way they think about the world so that they also uh, give uh, enough uh, credibility to things that are not elite controlled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you get the total quagmire that came out of it. And the interactions have been so appallingly bad that I can't see us handling any other pandemic, uh, which might we'll, we'll, we'll almost certainly come our way. Uh, probably worse than we came to COVID. We, we did such a total stuff up there with uh, the, the whole idea of lockdowns, which is a, you know, it's an epidemiological technique to isolate and slow transmissions. It's been put across as a attempt by the elites to put microchips inside your bloodstream and other madness like that and handled so badly that most countries are completely uh, resistant at the, 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 the public citizen now to any idea of lockdowns or even masking. And, right. I mean, uh, it I think, was, I think, you know, yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. I think it was handled poorly or, or, or certainly not in an optimum way by almost everyone. So, you know, science is not the truth. Science is the search for truth. Uh, that's yeah. what the scientific method is about. And scientists mm -hmm. often rethink their hypothesis when new information comes out. But during COVID, we had this, you know, unfortunate thing where the scientists would say one thing, you know, and this happened several times. The mm. medical profession would say one thing, and then they would have to revisit that and say something else. And mm. uh, all of that created, uh, understandably, distrust and confusion in publics. And, um, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a pretty, you're, you're right, Steve. It's a very good example of this dynamic that uh, organizations um, uh, are facing now and are, are not adjusting to it particularly well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I if I can jump in here, I would say um, I I'd like to spend a little bit more time on um, on on this quantification or description of the organic um, element within society. I think this is uh, absolutely brilliant, and when you when you mentioned it, Carmen, it actually resonated. Um, it, it strongly resonated uh, with with myself. Uh, you know, whatever intu intuition starts to alert around that concept. Um, Steve, I'm going to ask you, um, how would you, how would you model something like that? Like, I mean, it, it just, I mean, I'm really throwing you on the spot, but this is, this is a, uh, a, a function of what uh, economists do is they, 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 they model large populations and they describe these types of complex behaviors. And I think that your tradition and your work uh, is, is better positioned to model uh, complexity um, and feel free to elaborate on, on, mm -hmm. on chaos, which, uh, you know, Car Carmen's also familiar with, but please describe for the audience, how would you, how would you attempt to, to model uh, and describe the complex nature of that organic um, swelling or wellspring. Um, I'll be doing, I'll be taking two approaches to it. I mean, in terms of modeling, the two approaches that make most the most sense there as top system dynamics, the approach that Ty is so good at and that I've developed with Minsky, but also multi-agent modeling. And this sort of stuff is one place where you would definitely want to do multi-agent modeling uh, because you, you have different agents with different, uh, in, in, with different, concepts, different uh, environments affecting their behavior, and they will interact in ways that you don't expect if you try to do a top-down model. And that's the sort of thing where you know, sophisticated multi-agent modeling um, combined with scenario analysis, so you continue changing your, your environment and seeing how that changes what the, what the multi-agent thing converges to, that'd be extremely useful. I'll give my favorite example of uh, multi-agent modeling which is accessible to most people. There's a program which I've used on occasions, I haven't used it for ages now, uh, but called NetLogo. And NetLogo grew out of Logo, which is an attempt to treat object-oriented programming to children. Quite amusing. Uh, but what it had was you have a, a you draw a, 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 an area in which interactions occurred. And then you'd have rules about how uh, agents who are located on one space in the in the, the rectangle interact with other agents and see what happened and one of the symptoms was uh, it'd been meddling a party so you had about 20 or 30 groups which could form at a party and you would have a an inclination of the male and the female um agents who are not to want to be in a group of females and the intriguing was that it had even the Steve, slightest let's just say, sorry i'm going to interrupt steve can in you say favorite majority yeah. Can, can you say that again? Uh, the the tin can went over your head there for a minute, and I think it was a really important uh, explanation and point. So just just repeat what you just said there. And the, we, we've lost the, Steve again. Sadly, the, the superpower of freezing. Uh, my my voice has has has, oh, has frozen him. So it's coming up. Nope. I, I'll, uh, while we wait for Steve, I, I, I'll, I'll just tell you that. Uh, oh, here he is. Okay. Yeah, so uh, just to finish the story, the multi-agent model in that logo has an example called a, a party and having males and females at a party forming up groups as if the males have a slight desire to be in a male majority group as opposed to a female majority group. And if it's even close to 51% preference for male, then what you get is 100% male groups and 100% female groups. Uh, so the only way you can actually get mixing in this situation is to have people be willing to be part of minority. And the list, and that then what that tells you fundamentally is you want to bring about social cohesion in a in a uh, diverse population. Then what you have to do is get people to be comfortable to be a part of a minority. Now I'm. That's very much me. I'm very happy to be minority, and I've, I've been. I'm a minority in Thai society when I go there. I've been a minority in African societies. Um, I know, and I'm, I'm happy about that. I. Uh, but if you are at all, I'd rather be more people like myself. Then you get total segregation. 
you don't get a, a bit less mixing, you get total segregation. So that sort of multi-agent simulation, I think would be extremely useful for an organization like the CIA that's trying to say what's gonna happen out of these complex social interactions. And when you do it, of course, the bottom-up stuff you're talking about, Carmen, becomes far more important because that's often sets the milieu within which those decisions are made. And you could be trying to impose a top-down control. And if you're not linked into that bottom-up movement, which, of course, we're seeing in China right now with reactions to the lockdown, we saw with Iran over the uh, execution of that woman, um, the, 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 the pushback, if you don't have, if you have, an, if you don't have the pop population to some extent represented in your simulations, and if there's pushback within that population, the world is going to be a totally different place to what you model. And your interactions, if you go in without that knowledge, will be disastrous, probably the opposite of what you wish to achieve. And I think that's a large part of what I've seen is the history of the CIA over time. Well, I, I would I would agree that a lot of times, you know, uh, the uh, a government will come up with a fantastic strategy and think that they're going to be pulling levers and the puppets will fall in line and, and the strategy yeah. just doesn't work. And uh, this uh, uh, fact you pointed out about how men and women in, in the model would mingle is a, is a very uh, a phenomenon that I'm familiar with and uh, mm. have thought about it a lot in terms of social dynamics that really the uh, tipping point to get a diametrically opposite result can be very, very slight. So, you yeah. know, when you're, for example, thinking, you know, how close is society X to a revolution or some complete breakdown in order? And you may, you may say, oh, well, only 30% of the U.S. population believes X, right? Uh, and thinking, oh, well, you're still far away, but, but maybe you're not because the dynamic of it is, is quite different. Uh, there was a, a, a book uh, that was published gazillions of years ago, and if I went down to my library, I could find my copy. But it, it was a study of a small town in Germany uh, mm -hmm. between the two world wars. It's like a, it's not a big town at all. You've never heard of it. And someone had done a sociological study of how that town, uh, became a supporter of Hitler and the Nazi party. And uh, I always thought that that would, you know, and this is 15 years ago uh, now. So I think today the uh, uh, technology and the approach and the algorithms would be a lot better. But I always thought it would be a cool idea to take all that information in that book and mm. then try to model it and then and, and see if you could get the model to do the same thing that actually happened in history and then reverse engineer it and figure out what would have been the critical differences that would have led to a different outcome. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, I, that's, that's a I, I, I have, don't have the math skills to do that. I'm a complete basic idiot on math. So it would have been someone else uh, who would have to do that. But I, I always thought that that would be, you know, a really interesting uh, idea is to take some known moments of history and then find a situation where we have really fine grain detail on and then work the model there to see what you can get. Oh, that'd be a very intriguing use of the technology. I think I've just to give an example that I haven't done it yet. I've, had, I've got two big jobs to work on right now, so I have haven't had time to do this side one that I thought of. But I've seen lots of people saying that most of the people who've got COVID these days or getting ill have been vaccinated, which shows vaccination doesn't work. And there's a very simple system dynamics uh, model that you can build, which I, I, I probably take me about four hours to build. I imagine I tried doing it, uh, where if you have a population which is vaccinated and therefore has lower, and has lower susceptibility to the disease, uh, and you run the simulation over time, then you're going to find ultimately most of the people getting the disease are going to have been vaccinated because that's reduced this absolute total number of instances exactly. of severe illness. Yeah. And what people see though, well, the proportion's gone up. They don't realize the actual number's gone down. And that's right. that sort of lack of awareness is where a lot of stupidity comes from, I think. <laughs> well, statistic, you know, I, I, I do think that um 
however we educate ourselves, we just don't do a good enough job at getting people to understand statistics and probability and this, you know, from, from this failure are born many conspiracy theories. Yeah. Very, very well put. Very well put. Yeah. Mm. So are you, you are no longer a CIA analyst. What are you now? I am an, uh, I am an independent person and I do independent things. So, uh, I, um, I, I dabble basically I'm retired and I, and I dabble. Um, uh -huh. the last, public thing I did that people could easily find is I spoke, uh, I was, I did a presentation with uh, a colleague at South by Southwest earlier this year. Okay. And um, it was, I'm very interested in how we think, you know, that's my, my main area of expertise, so to speak. Uh, people at the CIA tend to specialize on particular, uh, parts of the world. And as my career went on, I became much less interested in any particular part of the world and much more interested in what is good thinking? What is a good idea? How do we develop it? What is insight? I could go on. And so that's what I, I spent a lot of time writing on, uh, talking on, and I do it uh, basically as an amateur, uh, which of course means you know, I'm a amateur is the root is love. So it's when someone does something big out of love that because they just love mm. to do it. Mm. Which mm. book? What is the book name? I think you're referring to the book that you're um, <clears throat> about about the populations and being able to. You know, oh, I wish I mean, the... I'd have to go I'd have to disappear for five minutes and go look at my library because I don't uh, you know, uh, I don't organize my library uh, uh, because I like I like randomness and I want to invite randomness <laughs> into my life. So there's and also I'm slightly lazy and that's also a, 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 a good. <laughs> I, I you know I, I I can relate with that. You don't you know you know do you blame it on randomness or do you blame it on laziness? Well, they they kind of go hand in hand when it's human nature, I suppose. <laughs> I think that with one I've just actually so it's rebels at work, a handbook for leading change from within. Yeah, that's that's the a people... that's the book that I I co-wrote, and then the book yeah. on on the the sociology of a small town in Germany during the okay. interwar period. That you know was a very you know. I'm sure that was somebody's PhD that got published, and I I would really have to search to try to find it for that one. Yeah, yeah. didn't find that one. That's just the one I found. The um, yeah, yeah, rebels at work. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've been, my entire existence has been being a rebel at work. So it, it's uh, and and what it struck me, and this comes from an academic perspective, it's incredibly hard to shift a paradigm. A paradigm is a yes. way of viewing the world. Okay, and that'll like in 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 we in the astronomy. Paradigm in astronomy used to be the uh, helio, the the Earth centric, that the Earth is oh. the center of the universe, and okay, and that that lasted for fifteen hundred years, or well, actually more like two thousand years. Um, well, that's shifting one of that one. My favorite uh, examples of things or things I like to say is that our ability to know is a function of our tools for knowing, and uh, yes. we forget this all the time. And uh, mm. of course, the, the Greeks, the Arabs, uh, the Chinese, uh, many societies developed uh, tools for navigation. And mm. uh, these tools for navigations were also useful because they were navigating by the stars to kind of track what was going on in the sky. So that mm. was advanced knowledge a little bit, but we didn't really get the big breakthrough until uh, the uh, Europeans uh, started working and observing the planets, and and that breakthrough was a result of the telescope. And so, exactly. you know, people figured exactly. out how to make telescopes. Galileo, what, how did he make his living? He was one of Italy's best telescope makers. So, mm. conventional wisdom is, uh, I would say, is that wisdom that is derived from the current generation of tools for knowing. That is beautifully and put. That tools, is beautifully put. Tools, of course, can it also include methods, right? 
And yeah, yeah. when we get smarter, because maybe a new technology is developed or there's a moment of insight, again, what is that really? I don't know. Mm. It's be fun mm. to figure that out. Uh, you know, how it happens neurologically. What What is going on? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, th that, that new method, new tool is what generates the new idea. And yeah, a lot of people, you know, have a really hard time um, coming to grips with, you know, they grew up with a generation of tools mm. and, and they just can't adjust to them, to the new generation. Yeah, and that's exactly what I've been doing in economics. So the tool in economics is equilibrium thinking. And that means you've got to use the tools of linear algebra fundamentally um, and optimization. And they've, they've stolen a bit from system dynamics in terms of optimization theory. But they're not at all in dynamics and complexity. In fact, all their all their tools actually rule out the possibility of complexity. They don't even right. the whole idea that there can be an unstable equilibrium horrifies them. So they leave right, the right, and and, and and yet you know chaos theory, uh, at least as I understand it, is that uh, that unstable equilibrium can be a very oh. you know productive place to be. Yeah, the whole idea of equilibrium is desirable. Is, is a hangover from the, you know, if you're going to balance a stick on another stick, it's desirable to reach the equilibrium. Otherwise, the right. stick falls over. But a right. living system, being out of equilibrium, is actually where creativity comes from, creativity exactly. and change exactly. and evolution. Yep. So the right. tools actually set up your mindset as well. And that's exactly. why, like, I mean, in my major focus in economics has been to build a set of tools that mean that the next generation can understand complexity and dynamics and non-equilibrium behaviour and leave about right. this appalling hang up that the old tools give you and believing equilibrium may exist a good thing right yep uh, i want to interrupt with one amazing book recommendation um oh, this is from james glick mm. this is uh, have you read it carmen no no but i just you know like the title it it <laughs> yeah <laughs> well uh, and 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 uh, Steve, have you read it? I, I mean, yes or no? I don't know. Test to see if you're still frozen. Oh yeah, um, yeah. This is a book that I I heard about this author from uh, Robert Sapolsky, and um, he's an endocrinologist, somebody that I've you know read and listened to a lot of his material. Um, he read this book and he 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 recommended it and he said it was so good. He he started reading it immediately after he read it the first time. Wow. <laughs> so wow. James that Glick is is yeah he's um he's a he's a really good author. Uh, I've read all of his books, but for someone who wants to to learn more about chaos, uh, I, I highly highly recommend this book uh, from James Glick called mm -hmm. Chaos, a national bestseller. Yeah, may I make a recommendation for something for the audience and everyone to read? I think yep. I can share my screen, correct? Yep. So I read this article last night. It'll, it's a it's a good, you know, four or five thousand words, so it'll take you a little while. But I thought it was just so uh, fantastic that I I want to share it with people, and it's how to speak honeybee. And it's from, uh, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that. I don't know, Daniel or Steve, if you have an idea, Noma. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, you read what the art, and then you read the next three paragraphs, and then you're just blown away. And basically, there's a lot of discussion here as to how, um, uh let's see where am i am i still here because i i stopped sharing and i don't know what happened yeah 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 i'm still here okay uh but uh the um, are page responsive okay well, I'm gonna raising wait. up no. yep yeah anyway it, it's it, it's it's basically you know and thinking that we stand the planet we live on and the species we uh, live here with. And uh, we are, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, and uh, things and, and that you have. <laughs> Sorry. 
Oh, how to speak uh, honey. How to speak honeybee? Yes. Okay, and I found it. It's okay. a web, it's not a book. It's a website. Yeah. It was excellent. Okay. And well, I then, actually uh, think we'll you're from your woods. Is from where? Did you say? Academic who wrote it is is from your uh, um, part of the woods. Oh, okay. I, I think uh, she's, in, Canada, I think so she's it's, from it's, somewhere in Canada, if not uh, uh, British Columbia. Hmm. Well, that's actually where uh, the, the co-host is um, from as well. Both both Tyrone and myself are actually uh, from the Pacific coast of Canada. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I, I think um, I, I, you've got a, such an incredible ability to curate uh, uh, well-written work. I know I've approached a couple of the uh, the people that I, I first found from you, Carmen, and I've actually uh, had them on, on my site. Oh, nice. And uh, yeah, ex um, yeah. And so uh, I, I, I recommend uh, for listeners to, uh, to, you know, to look up these references and uh, we'll make sure that we put them in the YouTube description. So uh, check out the YouTube descriptions post uh, video and we'll make sure that we put the material in there. Um, we are coming across the the top end of the hour. I don't know what happened to uh, Steve. He must have been so disappointed with the quality of the show. He must well, have been really upset have, at talking about away. talking with you. Yeah, yeah he... He, he probably didn't like my shirt or didn't like Carmen's hoodie. I don't know what it was, but uh, uh, we, you know, um, <laughs> we want to, want to, I want to really thank you, Carmen, for, uh, for spending this hour with us. I hope, I hope you, uh, you got something out of it. Uh, and it was I really did. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Really nice to see you again. And uh, I hope we can stay in touch periodically um, for, Everybody that's listening, uh, that's us signing out, and we'll we'll say goodbye now, and uh, we'll see you all next week. I hope everyone has a great holiday. And, uh, we did it again. Now, uh, as I said, our last show was canceled after you appeared on it, so fingers crossed the executives don't do that again. The more I read in the New York High School thing, the more I, I just, you know, my scratching my eyeballs out all the time. I'm the okay. voice of God in the background. Oh, geez. <laughs> Once the coins get uh, warm enough because of your body temperature in the winter, it actually keeps you <laughs> moderate beer drinking in the evenings. Well, that's inspiring for a Saturday morning.